up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and this is part 31 of my ranking and reviewing the Grateful Dead's Dave's Picks, their archival concert release series. Um, more like me reviewing and then ranking, though uh, the ranking's actually already been done, and I'm not going to share it with you for a while. So I'm going to review and then rank, ranked and reviewed. I don't know, whatever. I'm going to talk about this release, a fantastic release, a release I absolutely love, and then I'm going to show you where that release ranks among the other 30 I've already discussed. Um, this is a complete show from uh, December 3rd, 1979, uh, with some bonus material, um, some material from the following show, December 4th, 1979, three songs from that second set. Um, so December 79, we're what? April to December, how many months is that? Eight months, a little under eight months into the Brent Midland run. And this show, I think, really captures the early enthusiasm of those years with the fact that they're now, of those months, or that year in particular, of those early Brent years, that early enthusiasm with now we've been playing together for like seven and a half months, seven and a half months, and this is what we can do. This is a really, really good show. And I think there were moments, I think the set list is fantastic. Um, the There's a randomness to a little bit of the set list that is fantastic. Maybe sort of them still figuring out where to put things in like this era of the dead. Um, there are some really good performances throughout, so throughout the entire show. Um, Excellent solos, some great jams, um, some moments that kind of don't work, but work because they don't work. We'll get to that later. Um, but ultimately, it feels to me like it's a Jerry show. Like Jerry is just feeling right. And he's going to sing a little bit extra hard. He's going to put a little bit more emotion into, into his vocals. And when he gets a chance to play the guitar, he's going to play for really long stretches of time and do a lot of different things. Um, and the energy from start to finish is just, just perfect. Um, there are lulls, lulls uh, throughout the show, but I think those lulls are needed and come at exactly the right moment. Um, but they're not necessarily lulls. It's just like, we're bringing things down for a while. First set, disc one, the entirety of first set sits on disc one, make, makes it on disc one, opens up with an Alabama getaway into promised land combo, high energy, we're bringing the rockers, we're bringing the fun, everybody's in a good mood, like you can feel the vibe. Oh, where is this show from, from by the way? It's from Chicago, Uptown Theater. Uh, they seem to always play good shows here, starting off strong. Um, and that to me is like the opening salvo. And like at the end of the set, they will close with a really high energy, really rocking, really fun. The music never stopped, which almost seems to echo that opening energy and almost seems to complement it or like bookend it in a weird way that like, I don't know, kicks off and concludes the show in a really satisfying way. And the fact that that's the entirety of disc one, it also works in a really good sort of cohesive album thread type way. So we get the opening Alabama Getaway Promised Land. Brown-Eyed Women, so solid performance, always always down for a brown-eyed. El Paso, and then a ramble on Rose that Jerry is singing his butt off on. Like, Jerry is into this. Like, Jerry can sing like the Tennessee, the ramble on, the brown-eye. Uh, he has one more loser. He's got different, like, sort of, like, Sometimes he's angrier. Sometimes he's like more resigned to his fate. Sometimes there's hopeful. Sometimes it's despairing. This one is just like charged. I don't even know. It's not like he's necessarily angry as much as he's just like, Ugh. it's a really good ramble on Rose. And then what I think is kind of the glue that holds the whole set together in a really weird way, almost this like really high energy plateau in the middle of the set is as it's all over now. Um, and it's just, it's like a nine minute version of it. It's high energy, but it never really peaks or dips. It's just this solid high energy nine minutes where you get a really solid performance of the song by Bob. You get a fantastic solo by Jerry vocals, a great keyboard solo by Midland. And then Jerry responds to that with an even better little solo. That's a lot shorter, but way more intense. And then the song just, you know, plays out in like high energy rock and fashion. A great version, nine minutes, right smack dab in the middle of the first set. 
Then we're on to the second half of the set. We get a jack a row, pretty solid jack a row. We get a lazy lightning supplication. Supplication is the first time we kind of go into that deep space mode, kind of start exploring, and then we rebuild back that back up until we're back into the crazy into way that she makes me feel, or whatever it is that he says. And he Bob is in this. Bob is like. I've been paying attention to what Jerry has been doing vocally. I'm going to bring it at the end of this supplication. So he brings it at the end of this supplication. Then we get what might be my favorite moment of the first set, only because it, it seems like it's not working, but Jerry makes it work. And that is Althea. It's a long Althea. It's an Althea in which Jerry sings the bridge in the last verse twice I maybe having forgotten he sang them. Um, uh, it is a really slow tempo, laid back version that almost seems lethargic at first when you're just like, wait, what, what, dun, dun, dun. I mean, it just, it's a little, I don't know, it's a little off, but then Jerry starts singing and he just delivers it like, there's this even keeled nature that's almost slightly resigned, but there is something to this vocal performance that is just fantastic. And it just, it works with the weird little slow tempo and it just simmers for a little bit longer than most Althea's. And it just, Jerry plays a fantastic solo after the, the this space is getting hot part. Then at the end of that solo, they go back into this space is getting hot. And then they play another really short solo and they go back into the final verse. Um, is that, no, no. He plays, I think he plays like three solos, right? Um, now I'm forgetting what he did. I think they do the whole song as normal. And then in that ending, yeah, that's what he does. They do. They play the song as normal. And then at that ending closing jam solo, he goes back into the, uh, the um, this space is getting hot bridge. And then they do the final verse. So you get a little just extra bonus Althea at the end. It's just, it's weird, but it's fantastic. Um, and then an awesome music never stop, as I mentioned earlier, to close out the first set. Fantastic first set. Solid listen. A lot of fun. Second set has song that almost never goes wrong. We get a Scarlet Fire. The Scarlet is perfect. High energy. Um, the middle, like, solo, standard solo jam is high energy. When they go into the actual, like, post-vocal jam, they drop down into, like, deep space. Like, set a serious tone of, like, we're going to explore. We're down here in that area. Jerry's, like, bringing it down. The energy's down, but very open. And, like, let's play for a while. Let's improv and see where we go. They don't go crazy, crazy deep in this. It's some pretty, like, normal, typical exploring and they quickly, maybe, it's a, it's a 12 minute Scarlet, but it still seems like I want more deep space, but they start to escalate the energy toward fire, maybe a little earlier than expected, it seems like, or maybe a little earlier than normal, but they, you realize at some point they're gonna go into fire on the mountain, and it takes a while for them to get to fire on the mountain. They're like jamming out that segue. It's playful, it's lively, you can tell they're having fun. Jerry's like, just seems like he's having a good time doing anything guitar related. Uh, they finally like step into fire for real and it's still a long time playing with the different themes before they get to the vocals. And then between, between all of the lyrics, whenever Jerry gets a chance to drop a solo, he drops a solo. They all sound different. Some are a little fiercer, some are angry, some are evil and almost psyche. Like Jerry is having so much fun with this. Um, I think this is the one that is a weird like splice issue where they had to get some maybe tape issues and there's a jarring little moment, but it does in no way hurt the overall home run aspect of this Fire on the Mountain. Like I am always surprised when I see other people talk about this show or know other people that they don't rave about this Fire on the Mountain. Maybe for some reason it's just hitting my buttons the right way. I am raving about this Fire on the Mountain. I love this Fire on the Mountain. Samson and Delilah follows. Fire on the Mountain is so good. I really, really like the Samson and Delilah, a song that I've just gotten tired with over the years. And Jerry's solo in this just is just kind of nasty. It's just nasty. Jerry's nasty. Ugh. Then we get a Terrapin Station. Beautiful Terrapin Station. Terrapin Station is always beautiful. Um, really just your typical, awesome, grand, well-performed, spaciness in all the right places and the lady with the fan part. Um, the um, 
One thing that really stands out is in the end of the Terrapin Station Jam, when they're da 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 that part. Um, there are moments when I think, I don't know if it's either Midland's organ work or whether Bob's doing something different, but those transitions between the da 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 parts are a lot more fluid and maybe a little more like blendy than they normally would be when the band's like hitting those transitions harder and building that momentum. And so there's, I don't know, there's a little bit of more of a lyrical melodic quality to this instead of that like stomping psych jam quality um, at moments. I don't know, maybe I've just listened to too many Terrapins and I'm just, I, it, but it's a minor thing, but I think it's there. Um, then normally we get drums at this point, but Bob's like, we're not done. And we get a playing in the band about a 12 minute playing in the band. And once they go into the jam session, the jam is really interesting. It's like a two part jam, almost kind of reminds me of, I don't know what it reminds me of, um, maybe like a King Crimson type thing. But like the first half is this really pretty straightforward play and exploration that just kind of, just kind of slightly gets a little more jammier and weirder and more intense. like over increments of time. Like it's, there's never this drastic left turn or right turn or you're not going anywhere crazy. Everything's just getting a little bit, little bit more intense, intense and kind of builds and builds and builds and reaches a not too crazy, but obvious peak. And then they bring it down. And once they bring it down, it just kind of unravels and like this funky little vibe comes in, comes in and then it's psyche crazy and then it's Jay-Z jazzy. And it just seems like, all like everything just gets untied and it's just like flaying in the wind. And sometimes they're blowing in the same direction. Sometimes they're doing, f I mean, it is, but all of it is pretty subtle. None of it is too crazy. None of it is too out there, but like the overall effect from that early, just straightforward build to like the unraveling heading into drums. I don't know. It just works perfectly. I don't know if I would rank this as one of the best planes ever, but I think it is a incredibly interesting and intriguing and like one of those listens that like, I don't know, pays off with repeated listens. This is a show I've listened to um, more than some of the other Dave Spicks. Um, that we get drums, disc three, we get a space, pretty short space. Um, and then that goes into a lost sailor, saint of circumstance. I have a weird relationship with lost sailor. I don't think it's a particularly good song. Honestly, I think there's a great idea somewhere in Lost Sailor that m wasn't fully executed. I think it's a little Bob's trying too hard to be a little too Bobby in his weird convoluted writing. But I love the song because I truly think the music creates the feeling of being on waves, being at sea. And because I'm never able to really hook into like a melody or hook into like what I think is like the set, the songs like center point. I feel lost when I'm listening to it. And Bob and victim of the crime, when that, when they first started playing that, like it was uncomfortable. Like people complained about it. Like if you were in crowds in like the early mid eighties, um, I was not there until the mid eighties, but people were still complaining about victim of the crime all the time. Um, or whenever I saw, yeah, like it was the song nobody liked because it made people feel uncomfortable. It was negative. And like, I guess even as once the album came out, even once we had like the late 80s, the 90s, people complained about Victim of the Crime because it made them feel uncomfortable. It wasn't a dead song, it, like all that stuff. Bob does a really good job of writing music that almost literally transforms, you know, it's a great representation of his lyrics, right? Hell in a Bucket, feels like you're going to hell in a bucket, right? Um, I Need a Miracle. Someone needs to save this song. We need a miracle. Um, and this song, Lost Sailor, you feel lost. It just feels like it's missing something. But it works. This performance in particular even feels more lost than a normal Lost Sailor, so it doubly works. That goes into a pretty song, strong state of, circum state of circumstance. It saves a little bit of the energy, refocuses at th things. We go into a fantastic Wharf Rat again, Tennessee Jed and Warfrat, two songs I've realized that if they're in a set list, they are going to be good. And a set closing truckin', which good, great energy. Um, 
Oh, the one thing, there's a really good jam at the end of Warfrat that seems like it's going to peak and like slide right into trucking. It almost seems like they're going to... Uh, they don't. They they just drop it and then kind of start over. So it's a moment they missed. Uh, but at the end of trucking, uh, there's a really good jam and the jam reaches like, you know, an, an early trucking peak and then goes back down and then they rebuild it again and they peak again in a really nice explosion. And then they don't end the song there. They like bring it back down and jam again. And then somebody just is like, hey, you got to stop jamming, guys. You've already done that like twice. And it just kind of ends and they do some like gratuitary, like gratuity, gratuitary, whatever. They do some gratuitous, just sort of da da song ending uh, nonsense. But it's a pretty fun, pretty good truck. And, and then we get a Johnny B. Good as an encore. And then the bonus tracks, uh, three shows from the second set of the following night, Really strong estimated profit was a profit was with a really nice jam. A Franklin's Tower, pretty good Franklin's Tower. Um, but at the end of Franklin's Tower, they go into this pretty straightforward jam that's pretty much just that two chord back and forth, that dun 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 dun, 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 dun you know, just going back and forth between those two ideas. And it's pretty much that. Like they're not actually playing the chords, but you can hear the shift. You know, they're still following that same, but you know, they're doing that. Uh, and that goes on for quite a while, um, maybe five or six minutes. And then I think Jerry leaves. Um, and then all of a sudden Midland takes over and things just kind of get funkier and weirder and crazier. And they play that all the way out into, I think, drums or the, the track fades out. But I think it actually goes into drums at the actual show. Um, but yeah, it, it's fantastic. The estimated Franklin sound great, but that jam at the end, it's just oh, a really, really nice way to end disc three. So I absolutely love this show. I think the energy is fantastic. It's not perfect. Um, lost Sailor is definitely lost. Althea might not be your favorite Althea. I think it works fantastically. I think it's just an all around solid, a great, great selection by Dave. And where do I put it? I have it right now at number 10. Um, out of 31. And I would say these top 15 are fantastic. I almost put it up at nine, right above volume 24, but that, I think the other one from volume 24, maybe that entire like third disc is probably better than everything on this volume 31, on volume 24, that really solid end of that second set. Um, that's probably better than everything on this volume. So even though I think this volume is just such a great joy ride from start to finish, there are moments on that volume 24 which which trump this. Uh, no, I did not, which beat this. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's that. That's what I got. Um, let me know what you think of the show. Let me know if you do listen to it and check it out, uh, what, what you think of it. Yeah, you know how this works, people. Like, subscribe, comment, and most importantly, go listen to music. Go listen to all the music. Peace. Talk to you later.